I'm from the Huron-Perth Healthcare Alliance. We are an alliance of four hospitals in southern Ontario. The Stratford site is the largest of the four, with about 130 beds, considered a small general hospital. The other three, St. Mary's, Clinton, and Seaforth, are smaller, considered rural hospitals with about 20 beds each. We are uh, about 1,200 staff, um, but in total about 200 beds. We started our journey for the improvement of patient-centered care and uh, improved patient engagement in about 2010-2011. Similar to other ho hospitals that have expressed this today, we had adopted lean methodology, but we recognized we needed to marry the two. So it, for us, it's about increasing the voice of the staff, increasing the voice of the patient to co-create the way we deliver care. So it's marrying patient and family-centered care with uh, lean methodology, and we've coined that process optimization. We have uh, developed a new framework to guide us to build that infrastructure and to transform our culture. And uh, as was mentioned, we have a patient and family experience steering committee, for which I chair, and for which we have a family, family member of, um, as well as a patient on that committee. And we spent the last year reviewing a tremendous, a tremendous amount of data as well as um, talking to many hospitals both across Canada and the United States. And from that, we brought together this framework about the patient and family engagement and staff engagement and about staff satisfaction and patient and family satisfaction. So that is our framework built on our foundational principles of supporting people, strengthening partnerships, and improving performance. Patient engagement is the cornerstone of this framework. And I can't go into detail about our framework because this is about how we engage patients in our project. Uh, but it is about building the infrastructure to support patient and family engagement across all aspects of the organization and how we bring that voice and the staff's voice to the center of everything we do and really guide that. Uh, this was introduced in 2014, so we are very brand new at this and we're working very hard at various initiatives. So today, we want to talk about a little more about that. Um, but our, our patient and family engagement is the cornerstone. So the problem that we discovered is, um, and one of the things that we wanted to evaluate is bedside shift report. And um, my background is nursing. I've been nursing for 38 years. And this is really happenstance. It's not taught in school. It's, uh, you basically adopt the unit norms of where you work. Um, it, sometimes it's just the nurses, sometimes it's a, a collaborative team depending on the department and the area of the hospital. There's no standardization and it is not supported by evidence-based practice. And when we did a literature search for this particular project, we learned that 65% of Sentinel events are related to communication at transition points. I'm not using that properly, am I? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That one. Um, across the literature, though, it really varied with regards to Sentinel events, but the most uh, accurate data we could find was 65% related to Sentinel events. And that is really quite dangerous. So we had to take a, a really good look at this problem and how were we going to proceed. Um, and this is where we knew we had to involve patients as well as staff in this project. So we had both leaders, but patients and staff really looking at um, how can they be involved in this. And so Kathy's going to explain how they were involved from the very beginning of submitting the project going forward. They were members on the project team. They designed the implementation process. They were involved in uh, training the staff. We have two pilot units. One is on uh, at the Stratford site in the surgical inpatient unit, and one is at one of the rural sites, which is a 20-bed unit. So we wanted to have that cross-array of piloting something. So they were involved in that, and also um, attending staff meetings afterwards, so very much part of the change process. And because Kathy is really the most important person to be speaking today, I'm going to hand over to her now. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> so I'm Kathy Bachner, the patient partner for the Huron Perth Healthcare Alliance. And you're probably wondering what on earth somebody who has nothing to do with the medical system has to offer to a research project about the transfer of accountability at bedside. But it turns out that my three-month stay with necrotizing fasciitis at 
four different hospitals I experienced, you learn a little bit about um, about how the hospital system works. Uh, during that time, I was in a transition at that hospital where they had transfer of accountability at bedside and where they didn't have transfer of accountability at bedside. So that taught me some important lessons. Now, as part of the project, I was able to share some of those things that I learned. First of all, I learned that with the transfer of accountability at bedside, or the bedside shift report, there is a real reduction in the anxiety levels that patients feel. Uh, in increasing patient safety, sometimes I was able to note a medication change or a bandage change that the doctor had made, but it hadn't shown up on the nurse's reports yet. It does reduce errors. And it's a chance to further find our past history and learn more about our medical state. This becomes especially important if your patient happens to be suffering from dementia. So the imp importance of engaging family members at that time becomes increasingly important at times such as that. And it becomes with the added uh, benefit of reducing the number of falls and call bells because it turns out that if we know what's going on, we tend not to be pressing that button every few minutes. And I did watch people, uh, you know, trying to get out of bed and do things I knew from across the room they should not have been doing uh, because they didn't know what was going on and trying to do things that they just simply couldn't do. Um, and as a patient, one of the things we talked about in our committee was the, the use of the whiteboards. In that discussion, it was very interesting in terms of safety. We did have a discussion. One of the nurses said, you know, maybe the DNR status should be on that whiteboard. So we all knew what was going on. And I quickly said as a patient, just, just a minute, um, I know that you try to upload those whiteboards all of the time, but chances are once in a while you're trying to save somebody's life and what's on that whiteboard falls down that line. And I really don't want to be that patient in the bed with DNR on, and that's not me. So <laughs> can you not put that on that whiteboard, please and thank you. Uh, they all understood that completely, but that was just something I learned from laying there in that bed. In addition uh, to the project, there was a broad spectrum of patient and family voices that were included in the development, implementation, and evaluation of the DOA process, providing both qualitative and quantitative data through pre and post focus groups and surveys. We used the Canadian Patient Sur Experience Survey, the Patient Satisfaction with Nursing Care Quality Questionnaire, the Patient Activation Measure, and the staff completed the Global Work Satisfaction Tool. Um, <clears throat> now, the patients also displayed an active role at the nursing training sessions, particularly in role playing. Now, before I got sick with necrotizing fasciitis, I'd spent 28 years, including like December the 7th, right before the Friday I got sick. Uh, I was in a grade 8 classroom teaching, thinking I was going to carry on doing that for quite some time. But the following Wednesday, I was in a coma where I spent the next two weeks and came out of that coma on Christmas morning. Um, during that time, um, it was very interesting to, um, to use that knowledge and my knowledge of t teaching to figure out how we were going to explain to the nursing staff why transfer of accountability was important. So we did use role playing in that, those teaching sessions and the patients did play a part in that education scenario. Uh, also to assist with TOA, I did a couple of things on the project. One was to put up a poster in the wall I, I made and so people would kind of have a sense of what this bedside shift report was. And another thing I learned from laying in the bed, sometimes when shift report happened, I was uh, highly medicated or um, uh, in a deep slumber because I'd just fallen asleep at 5 o'clock and you were waking me up shortly thereafter. So I did think it was really important that we had a patient pamphlet because on those moments that I or perhaps my husband was coherent, he was always coherent, me not so much, uh, I, he could, we could write down questions so that that TOA would become more effective and prompt and meaningful. So if he wasn't there, my husband wasn't there doing two away, I wouldn't have forgotten to have to admit to him when he came in, I'm sorry, I didn't even think about asking that. So there were questions for both nursing and doctor staff. Um, in addition, the uh, patient partners also played a role in the nurses' training video, and that video was made, uh, in fact, we're just in the making process of that, and that will be used to further sustain the project. Uh, so, now, I'm not the only patient who talked about this. Here's a list of other things that patients were saying. Gen generally, they're very comfortable about knowing what, that everybody's on the same page. 
and they feel it's beneficial. The nursing staff, they were asked for their comments as well. They wanted to know just how this was going. Um, one of the nurses said they like to have an eyeball at the first of the shifts. So they kind of know who they need to pay attention to immediately and who's going to be okay for the next little while. Um, and it generally, uh, they generally felt safer. However, we can't be kidding you, uh, there were obviously concerns about this new process. Uh, these concerns were um, really highlighted by the, rep the rep confidentiality, repetition, what can we do about those isolation patients, and this is just going to take way too much time. We're already you know, trying to do everything already. The one thing I liked about this project is we worked and listened very clearly to the nursing staff and what their concerns were. I felt like we weren't going to go very far very fast if we didn't listen to the people who were doing the job. So, we did have meetings, and during those meetings, we discussed their key concerns regarding confidentiality. We assured them that, uh, the nurses rather, that the patient is in control of whether or not the TOA happens at the bedside. At the beginning of each TOA, patients and families are asked if they would like to participate, and they're also asked who they would like to join that conversation. They're also, um, they also have a chance to say whether or not there are sensitive issues they simply don't want discussed at the bedside. Uh, rep regarding repetition, we stressed that yes, all this information is on Meditech and that's really, really important that you keep doing that, but it really is important that patients are included in that conversation about their own care. Best said, nothing about me without me. Um, this bedside TOA dovetails the transfer of information between incoming and outgoing staff in a very patient-inclusive atmosphere. To address the isolation patient, I was an isol isolation patient for quite some time, and it's a very lonely experience, and I'd like to say that, um, that you're, somebody's in there all the time, but in fact, it was a custodian who once saved my life because my brain had swollen in a condition called press. I'd had two small strokes and eight seizures and it was Brian who came in and went, there's something wrong with Kathy. And he ran out and he told me later he acted like a mosquito to the nurse who really thought that the custodian wasn't much worth listening to. And he listened and he said, I stuck by her until she came into your room. And, and it, it is very lonely in an isolation room. But it is important that the TOA happens at the bedside that, and we've asked that they do glove and gown so that that is also addressed. Then there's the concern of the impacts on time. The only thing that was going to help clarify this information is to have real data. We did that data, and in the end, we were able to find that that change of shift was reduced by approximately four minutes uh, to have this in place. That kind of information really has an impact on group thinking. As a wind-up today, and as we move forward to other best health care practices for everyone, I wish to thank CFHI, the HPHA, Patricia O'Connor, and the Health Innovation Forum I organizers, and to you for staying here on this very long day, and uh, helping us all move forward with health care discussions. Thank you so much. So in closing, I, I just want uh, what, what we learned, I hope you recognize it. it was so valuable to have uh, Kathy and the other individuals, Barb Fuster, with us because they changed the conversation. But the influence that they had on the staff during the education was phenomenal um, because there was an actual person there role playing and, and Kathy would say things like, well, could you just stand over there? It would be really helpful for me. And it would never have occurred to the staff to change the spot. So they, the, the, it, was, it was so valuable to have them as part of the project from the very beginning and as we bring closure and evaluation. Thank you.